We're going to begin in Matthew chapter 17 and um, look at this verse of scripture where Jesus spoke. We're going to look at it a couple of times tonight, but uh, this one particular time in which he spoke, I don't think he exaggerated what he said, and what he said was quite, um, quite interesting, quite astounding, really. In Matthew chapter 17 and verse 20, he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith, for truly I say to you, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you would say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move, and nothing will be impossible. That's quite a, quite a statement. And again, I don't think he was exaggerating. A mustard seed was the smallest object that the disciples would have known of in their, in their environment, in their society. Um, so Christ isn't emphasizing that you had to have great faith. He is emphasizing that you have to have a little bit of faith, you know, the, the faith of a, a mustard seed. And you can say to this mountain, be thou cast into the sea. So uh, there is great power behind faith. Uh, of all of the thousands that Jesus healed, and, and there were thousands, they all had one thing in common, and that is they all had faith that Jesus was the healer, or that Jesus could heal them. And uh, Jesus is our Savior, which includes healing and deliverance from uh, demonic influences. Jesus as the healer, we are to go to him with confidence and faith that he will heal us. Just to run through some verses with you that we've already looked at that emphasize the importance of faith. In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it shall be done to you as you have believed. In Matthew 9, 2, when the paralytic was let down by the four men, he said, Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. In, in Matthew 9, 22, Jesus turning and seeing, his, her, seeing her said, Daughter, take courage, your faith has made you well. That was the woman with the issue of blood who came up behind him and touched the hem of his garment. And then the woman who had the demonized daughter, the Canaanite woman, Jesus said to her in Matthew 15, O woman, woman, your faith is great, and it shall be done to you as you will. Look at Matthew chapter 21. We can go to many of the records. It's very clear that the only requirement for healing was faith in the healer, Jesus. In Matthew 21, in verse 18, now in the morning, when he was returning to the city, he became hungry, and seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only, and he said to it, no longer shall there be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. Seeing this, the disciples were amazed and asked, how did the fig tree wither all at once? Jesus answered and said to them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And all things that you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. It's an incredible statement. I mean, again, is he... Is he exaggerating or does he mean what he says and obviously I think that's the latter he means what he says doubt and and the the important thing here that I want to point out is not only the the faith piece what faith will faith will bring to us but also the only thing that undermines faith that Jesus taught consistently was doubt doubt breaks faith and that's if if, if all of the things when it all narrows down we're going to look at many of the doubts that we are confronted with that cause us to lose our faith or to not have faith. But when the least common denominator, the only thing that inhibits us 
from walking a supernatural life, uh, uh, having supernatural Christianity, from receiving healing and from helping others to be healed and ministered to and delivered, is this issue of doubt. So it's an important subject, and uh, we want to devote some time to this. Look at Matthew chapter 14. Matthew 14. Well, you're, I think you're familiar with this record. This is when Peter was walking on the water in Matthew 14, 28 since you're on your way there. And Peter said to him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, you of little faith, why did you what? Doubt. He doubted. And, you know, Peter was one of the great believers of all time. <laughs> you know, as far as history goes, as he, the things that he does in the book of Acts is, uh, you know, supernaturally extraordinary for sure. But at this point in his life, before, before Jesus ascended, Peter had issues with doubt. And what happened here he was walking on water, which is obviously faith. He looked around at the circumstances and took his eyes off the Lord. And what happened there was he began to doubt. And when he began to doubt, he lost his faith. Doubt is a faith breaker. And he began to, to drown. Again, the, the issue always is doubt hindering our faith. Peter, Peter also experienced the same type of a problem at another time when Jesus said to him, uh, you know, I'm going to Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to be tortured and I'm going to be killed. And Peter refuted him. He said, no, that, that can't be, Lord. He argued with him. And this is that record where Jesus said to him, get thee behind me, Satan. What happened to Peter here was, again, it's a, it's a doubt issue. It's a faith issue. Rather than believing the words that Jesus spoke, he allowed his emotions to influence his behavior. He loved Jesus. He couldn't imagine, imagine the Lord going through suffering and death. And because of his emotions, it got in the way of his faith. And faith is based upon believing the words that Jesus speaks or believing the words that God speaks. Of course, another record that Peter would probably prefer that we wouldn't refer to is uh, uh, when Jesus was taken into captivity. Jesus told them that you're going to deny me three times, or at least three times that night. And of course, that's exactly what happened. Why would this man of great faith, who only hours earlier picked up the sword and cut the ear of the soldier who was trying to take Jesus, why would he lose his courage and his faith? Fear. The circumstances were such that it caused him to doubt. It caused him to fear, which caused him to doubt, which caused him to lose his faith and to cower like he would, you know, wasn't Peter's style at all. He was a very courageous man. In James chapter 1, it says in verse 5, But if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously, without reproach, and it will be given to him. But we must ask in faith without doubting. There it is. In faith without doubting. Doubt is the enemy of faith. We must ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For the man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Again, the context of that double-minded man is going from faith to doubt, faith to doubt. That doesn't work. We have to have, you know, a persistence and, you know, on faith and not allowing the doubt to come in, which is why I, I really want to focus on in the next couple of sessions. I don't want to rush through this because it's so vital. It's so important that we expose the doubts that we would have to, to receive healing, to minister healing, to walk in the supernatural. In uh, Roger Sapp's book, Beyond a Shadow of Doubt, Faith for Healing, 
by removing doubts. This is a, a, a wonderful book. I highly recommend it. Um, I'm going to follow the format that he has in that book, plus I'm going to add some other things that I've, I've come to understand. Uh, we will look at the common doubts that prevent people from receiving their healing or ministering healing to others. Because doubts are often subtle, they are seldom identified initially as doubts. Those, uh, these subtle doubts are often built right into our understanding or our misunderstanding of God. The healing ministry in the church has been inconsistent, unreliable, and unpredictable, primarily due to unresolved doubts. And if we can start approaching some of these doubts that we might have in life, it should help us greatly. Uh, we should ask ourselves the question, what do you think it is preventing you from being healed? Or what is it that's preventing you from speaking in tongues? What is it that's preventing you from walking out into the supernatural realm? Asking yourself that question. If, if you see in the Word, as we have seen over these many sessions, that it is the will of God for His people to be healed and to minister to other people, then what is it that prevents me from doing it? And when we get an answer to that question, I've asked the question of myself, I ask it, uh, then that will reveal usually some doubt that I have. And if I, if I want to, if I want to uh, move forward, I must address the doubt with the word and replace it with faith. The answer that we would get to such a question will reveal a doubt that, uh, that you might have in the subject matter. A common response to that question is when you, the question is, why am I not being healed? A, a common response is, it's not God's will. Um, sickness is the consequence of my sin. It's not God's timing. It's the wrong timing. Uh, God has a special purpose for my sickness, and uh, that's why I haven't been healed. All of these and many more doubts prevent the power of God from being a reality in our life. Well, the first doubt that I want to look at tonight with you is, it's not God's will to heal all who are sick or injured. Not everyone gets healed, and I am one of the ones that does not. And, uh, you know, that th this is a, again, it's a subtle thing that creeps into people's thinking in their hearts. It's not God's will for me to be healed. Well, we can understand God's will by reviewing the actions and the words of Jesus Christ, because he always did God's will. It's not going to help us to focus on the Old Testament. We have to focus on the New Testament. We are a new covenant people. We're not living under the old covenant. We're not living according to the Mosaic law. We are living in what is called the administration of grace. And we want to focus on what Jesus said and what Jesus did what, what is recorded in the Gospels, and then that which is recorded in the church epistles to base our faith upon. Uh, but I've, I've pointed this out to you before in the class, and for those of you who've been around, have known me for any length of time, I've gone over these verses in John because they're so important to acknowledge that Jesus, what Jesus says repeatedly my food is, 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 what he says is, it's not my will, but the Father's will. In John 4, 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Why, why am I reading these verses? Jesus did God's will. He didn't do his own will. For, so uh, what is God's will? We can see God's will in what Jesus said and what Jesus did. In John 5, 19, Jesus therefore answering and saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of Himself unless it's something He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. John 5, 30, I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will but the will of him who sent me. John 6, 38. 
For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus healed thousands of people. He, healed th- he didn't heal a couple. He healed thousands of people. It is the will of God that people be healed. According to the actions of Jesus. In John 14, 10, The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. And then Hebrews 1, verses 2 and 3 says, In the last days he has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature. In Jesus, we see the exact representation of God's nature. We see the exact representation of God's will in manifestation in the life of Jesus Christ. So for me to turn around and say it's not the will of God for for someone to be healed or for me to be healed is in contradiction to what is so abundantly obvious in the lifestyle of Jesus and the things that he did. I mean, look at the, the, how, how much of the Gospels are filled with him ministering to people one-on-one or in a group or in a multitude. That's what he did in addition to teaching people. So Jesus' ministry does not support the idea that healings vary with individuals. The last four sessions that we, we have studied the things that we have looked at, the records in the Gospels, where Jesus healed everyone who came to him. There was no exception. Without exception, he healed everyone who came to him. In Matthew 8, 16, it says, When evening came, they brought to him many, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, And he cast out the spirits with a word, and he healed how many? All who were ill. In Matthew Matthew 12, 15. But Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Many followed him, and he healed how many? He healed them all. In Luke 6, 17 through 19, Jesus came down with him and stood on the level place. And there was a large crowd of disciples and a great throng of people from all of Judea and Jerusalem and the coastal regions of Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon is not Israel, that's north of of Israel, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were being cured. All the people were trying to touch him, for the power was coming from him and healing them, what? All. In Acts 5, we see that the apostles did the same thing. In Acts 5, 16, all this, also all the people from the cities of his, the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together and bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. Jesus never turned away anyone. Never, except the closest that we see that it came to it was this Canaanite woman who came and, and, you know, said to him, I want you to minister to my daughter. And he said, I, you know, I can't minister to you. I'm sent to the house of Israel. But with her persistence, uh, he even healed her daughter, right? So that literally we can say from our study of the scriptures, we've looked at it for four sessions. There was not one person ever that came to him and he said, no way. He healed everyone. He healed them all. So to, to, for us today to say that there's a discrimination or there's a, you know, there's a, there's a favoritism towards one and, and not towards another isn't really lining its self up with what we have seen in the scriptures and what the scriptures teach us. Another record that uh, Luke 17 that comes to mind regarding this. I've made mention of it before. We didn't really look at it, I don't think. Uh, In Luke 17, in verse 12, And as he entered the village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. 
And they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, where, where were there not ten cleansed, but the nine, where are they? Was not no one found who returned to give glory to God except for this foreigner? And he said to him, stand up and go, your faith has made you well. There's two things to point out in this record here. First of all, the guy that came back to him wasn't really an Israelite. He was a Samaritan. He, he, was, not, he was a half-breed, you know, a Samaritan. They, those they considered to be dogs. And, and then the other guys, he healed them, and they didn't really do the appropriate thing, did they? They didn't give thanks and glorify God. So what is that? Why am I pointing that out to you? Well, I'm pointing it out to you because Jesus... In all of the people that came to Jesus, I don't know of any record, I, don't know, I can't think of one single record where he asked them what their behavior was, what their morals were, or what their religion was. He didn't, he didn't qualify anybody by saying, have you been a good person? He didn't ask any of those questions. If the person came with faith that Jesus would heal him, he healed him. And he didn't heal them based upon what they would do after they were healed. Because these guys didn't do the right thing. Remember, we looked in the last session that the guy, he told, what was it, the leper, don't tell anybody? And he ran and told everybody and, and altered Jesus' whole thing there because of the multitudes. So he didn't heal people based on what they were going to do. He didn't heal people based upon what they had done. He healed people based upon their faith at the moment. So again, I, I think it's a weak argument to, to think or it's a weak doubt for us to question whether or not it is the will of God for us to be healed. Whatever the, whenever a person was, whether, whether it was one person or a small group or a multitude, Jesus heals all who come to him. And I don't think anything has changed in that. The truth that God does not show partiality means that everyone who meets the conditions of faith in Christ as the healer will be healed. Um, look at Luke chapter 4. I, I probably have worn this verse out over these sessions, but that's too bad. It's such a key verse. But I want to I read the rest of the section here a little bit with you. You're, you know, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, verse 18, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. That's, you know, he's, where he is when he's reading this is in Nazareth. Nazareth is the place where he grew up. That's where his family lived. That's where he grew up. After he starts his ministry, he moves to Capernaum. But growing up, he was in Nazareth. So he proclaims it. He closed the book of Isaiah in verse 20. He gave it back to the attendant. He sat down. All the eyes, the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He believed what he knew Isaiah 61 said, verses 1 through 3. He, said, he read that, he believed that to be God's will, because it was God's word speaking about him. And he said, well, now it's being fulfilled. He had that kind of confidence. And all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which he were falling from his lips, and they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? I think that kind of a derogatory thing. Is this not Joseph's son? I mean, where does he get off doing this stuff? Who is he? And he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we hear was done at Capernaum, where he was then living, do hear in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, 
no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you, in truth, there were more widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when the great famine came over all the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Zidon, to a woman who was a widow. She wasn't an Israelite. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman, the Syrian. Again, Naaman wasn't an Israelite. What is he saying to these people? He says, I understand. You don't believe in me. You doubt me. You think my father is Joseph. You know, familiar, what's that statement? Familiarity breeds something? Contempt? They didn't believe in him because of, they watched him grow up. You know, they saw him as a child, they watched him grow up, and they did not have confidence in him. He said, but it's not unusual, Israel did that in the time of these two prophets, you know, yet, and, and he didn't do any works there. <laughs> they doubted him. They did not believe him to be the Messiah and to be the healer. They looked at him, they judged on what their experience had been before that, because all those years that he was there, we don't think he did anything. His ministry began when he was 30-something years old. Now, you know, look at me. I'm sharing with you these things from the scriptures about the supernatural realm, about miracles. And yet, here I stand before you, I'm an older man, I've got no hair on my head, I'm wearing glasses, I, you, know, I, you know, you can look at me and look at my flesh and say, eh, I don't know if I want to believe this guy. He doesn't look like someone that really believes this. Why is he wearing glasses if he believes in healing? I remember the first time I saw uh, Roger Sapp, there's some videos of him on YouTube, which I highly recommend you listen to. And, and he's got a tooth missing over here, and he's got, you know, he's, the, the, the whole setting of the thing is unprofessional, and he's not particularly dressed nice, looks a little bit so-so. And I remember thinking when we first turned the video on, this guy's going to teach me about healing? And then I heard the words that he spoke, and indeed, he did teach me about healing. We don't allow our senses to determine our faith. We allow the scriptures to determine our faith. It's not how somebody else looks. It's not how, they, you know, they, they, were, they didn't, they, you know, they looked at Jesus and didn't think they saw the Messiah. They didn't get it. And it's the same thing that can happen, you know, when someone's praying for you. You can look at their flesh and doubt whether or not they have the ability to do it. Well, the, they don't. It's God working in the person that healed them, as it was true with Jesus. That's what we just read, those many verses. Roger Sapp says, uh, and I, I like to read this to you in, in his book, when someone meets the conditions, then in every case, Christ treats them the same. If a person can be healed, if one person can be healed, then all can be healed who meet the same conditions. No one can legitimately state that they met the conditions for healing and were not healed. When they, when they do, they are revealing a shadow, a shadow on doubt, or a shadow of doubt. Statements like these doubt the faithfulness of Christ in every situation. The statement also reveals that they are not apt to change their approach and continue seeking. They are, they are failing to take the responsibility for learning more until they receive. There is something still lacking in their understanding or they would be healed. This is not bad news. It's good news. It's, they still can be healed, but they must turn their attention to humbly seek Christ for an adjustment rather than doubting his faithfulness and adjusting their future. They must deal with their doubts and let their faith in Christ arise. They must move beyond a shadow of doubt by beholding Christ, the true light that enlightens every man and woman. 
That is what has happened to thousands, I would, you know, so many people. They, when they don't receive into manifestation the things that the Word of God says that they can, they doubt God. And once they doubt God or they doubt Christ, then it's just a matter of moments and they're not going to be around anymore. If, if I am not manifesting that which the Scriptures say is mine to manifest, the doubt, the, the thought I should have is, where's my doubt? I shouldn't be doubting God. I should be looking at me and saying, well, where is it that you need to increase your faith? Identify the doubt and then bring the word, you know, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. Bring the word to that doubt and raise the level. All of us fall short in this. I mean, there's none of us that don't. I mean, that's just, it's, uh, if you run into someone that says they don't believe them, uh, you know, we all have doubts. And, but again, rather than, than turning that on God, we want to turn it in and say, okay, God, teach me. Don't get all condemned and, and flustered and, and, and uh, oh, I can't I give up. Don't do that. You know, uh, we can, the scriptures say that we can walk like Jesus Christ walked. So you're obviously going to fall short. <laughs> I mean, you know, Jesus walked perfectly. So I'm sure none of, you, none of us have done that yet. We're working on it. We don't want to give up because we haven't yet manifested that which is ours. The second doubt that I want to... So, to sum up this first doubt, it is God's will that everybody be healed. It is God's will. Um, and then the this, this second doubt is, God has a benevolent purpose for my affliction. Look at Romans chapter 8. I mean, God has a purpose for it. That's why I haven't been healed yet because God's teaching me something. Or there's some benevolent uh, thing that's going to happen as a result of this, and that's why I have this affliction. I, I will not argue that afflictions will ha can help you to, to grow in your relationship with God. They can make you a stronger man or a stronger woman. There's no question about it. But to think that that is God's will, that you continue to suffer so that you can learn, I think that's hard to prove from the Scriptures. In Romans 8, verse 28, uh, this is a verse that seems to be misunderstood a lot. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Uh, people I've heard teach this, uh, that you know God has caused this affliction or this difficulty or this tribulation in my life so that uh, you know, I can grow and I can become better. For, but that's not what this verse says. We know that God causes all things to work together for good, to those who, are, who love God. It doesn't say that God causes all things. It says that God can cause all things to turn out for good. It doesn't say that he caused the problem. It doesn't, it doesn't attribute that to him. I mean, there's, there's a devil. There's evil. Uh, so I think that's a misunderstanding of this verse of Scripture. I think James chapter 1, which is, uh, it won't hurt to look at that. If you look, James chapter 1, it's, it's important to acknowledge that God doesn't use evil to bring about good, although God can bring good about from evil, but he doesn't, he doesn't create, create evil to bring about good. The evil is there, and from, he can, from that evil, bring good. You understand the distinction? In James chapter 1, in verse 3, Knowing uh, the, uh, the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect result. I really want to move further into that. Uh, verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. And I believe there's an ellipsis there. God does not tempt anyone with evil. God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone with evil. There's an ellipsis uh, you can see in the record. God does tempt people. to. We know he tempted Abraham, you know, so that he can work with people to prove them, to help them, but he doesn't use evil to do that. And I don't, I don't know what, what book you read but, or what lifestyle you have, but the sickness that I have is not good. 
it's 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 not something that it's not pleasant uh, you know the the it's evil you know it's not what god intended for his people to have or any people to have for that matter of the thousands of records about jesus healing and delivering people there's not one when he says it's not time you have a greater lesson to learn i don't remember him ever turning anybody away ever and saying to him God hasn't finished teaching you your, what he wants you to learn. So, again, that's a doubt that creeps in there, and a misunderstanding of some simple scriptures that can, you know, we can get better understanding about. I don't, you know, if you have that doubt, then you probably will not be healed. So uh, I don't think you have a biblical footing to, to believe that way, so it would be better to not believe that way. The next doubt we want to look at is, my sin is the cause of my sickness. And as such, God does not want to heal me. Well, there, there are certainly plenty of verses of Scripture that can support that kind of reasoning, especially if you focus in the Old Testament. The Old Testament provides a lot of underpinning for this particular doubt. In Exodus 15, in Deuteronomy 7 and, and 28 and uh, other, I mean, there's a lot there where it talks about, it talks about the blessings for those who are obedient and the curses for those who are disobedient, who are idolatrous and so on. And it, it specifically talks about physical ailments as a result of those not being obedient to the promises. But as I said before, our focus needs to be on the new covenant and not the old. And, and please bear with me, and I'll explain what I, why that's significant. Uh, there, you know, it, it, it's indisputable. There's an indisputable connection that is made in the Scriptures with obedience impacting our health and disobedience causing sickness and affliction. In the least common denominator, all sickness and disease and affliction are connected to sin. Uh, there's no question about that. If we all have physical weakness, we are all born dead in trespasses and sins. We're all born destined for death. Everybody is. So, and that is because of the original sin of Adam and Eve. It says in Romans 5, not that we sinned after the similitude of Adam. It doesn't matter if you did the actual sin. You're suffering the consequences of sin. We all are. And uh, we're all going to get sick and die or I don't know, maybe, maybe we can skip the sick, but we're all going to die until, unless the Lord comes back soon before you die. So I, there, is a, there is a definite connection between sin and sickness, but that doesn't necessarily mean that every time I'm sick, it's because I have recently committed a sin. I, I think that that's a, a jump in logic. Um, and so... It says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. What we, what we know from the scriptures is that repentance from sin and faith in Christ will break any curse of sickness or any affliction. Uh, we know that according to Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, Christ redeemed us, from the curse of the law. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. We're no longer under the curse of the law. In 1 John, in verse 9, it says, if, you confess, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That would be, the unrighteousness would be the consequences of our sin. If you sin, you, 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 you envelop yourself into unrighteousness. And that will be cleaned if you confess your sins. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, hmm, Ephesians chapter 2, um, that we were born... Even you who were dead in your trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked 
in your former life walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power there, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. Among, among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of the flesh and indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Verse 4 says, But God being rich in mercy, because of his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved. It's God's grace and God's mercy is the only way that anyone can be saved. It's not a, it's not, it's, that's including healing and deliverance also. Our healing and our deliverance is because of God's grace and because of God's mercy. You do not deserve to be saved, nor could you ever be good enough for salvation. And that salvation is inclusive of healing. How good would one have to be in order to be saved? How good would one have to be in order to be healed? That's not, we, we don't see that as being an issue with Christ. Faith was an issue. Um, and doubt. So you, you didn't deserve to be saved, nor could you ever be good enough for salvation, and salvation includes healing. So if, if your doubt is, I don't deserve to be healed because I'm a sinner, you're 100% right. You don't. And you don't deserve to be saved because you were born dead in trespasses and sins. And not only did you, were you born that way, you decided to stay that way. You walked according to the course of this world, according to the spirit of, that now works in the sons of disobedience. You lived according to the lust of your flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath. That's who we were. And yet, dead in our transgressions, God's mercy came in, and by His grace we are saved. So yes, you are, you're right. You do not deserve to be healed because of your sin. <laughs> Nor do you deserve to be saved. God is a God of mercy, and God is a God of grace. In Matthew chapter 9, in verse 27 through 31, the blind men come to Jesus and they cry out, Have mercy on us, O son of David! Have mercy on us, O son of David! The people understood the connection with the Messiah, mercy, and healing. They, the people then understood there was a connection between the Messiah, mercy, and healing. That's why they yelled out, Son of David, have mercy on us. They wanted to be healed. The phrase Son of David refers to the Messiah. The Old Testament prophecies reveal that the Messiah would have mercy on the afflicted and heal them. And uh, we've looked at these verses in Isaiah before, and uh, just I'm going to go over them real quick here. Isaiah 49, they're all there. It says, for talking about when the Messiah will come, they will not hunger or thirst, nor will, they, will the scorching heat of the sun strike them down. For he who has compassion, and that word compassion is interchanged in the Old Testament with the word mercy, on them will lead them and guide them to the springs of water. Shout for joy, O heavens, and rejoice, O earth. Break forth into joyful shouting, O mountains, for Yahweh has comforted His people and will have compassion, mercy on the affliction, on His afflicted. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion, no mercy on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you." These people had to have an understanding that the Messiah would come with mercy and that mercy would enable him to heal. They, they, they also read Isaiah 61, which is that verse that's quoted in Luke chapter 4, that he would come to set the captives free, to give sight to the blind, you know, and so on. They would read that verse and that's what they expected. The, so when they said, Son of David, have mercy on us, it was a biblical, there was a biblical basis to this faith that they had. So apparently the people in Jesus' day, uh, unlike the people maybe today, were expecting the, the Messiah, the son of David, to indeed have mercy to heal. Not only these two blind men who yelled out, the Canaanite woman with the daughter 
who I talked about earlier, who was cruelly demonized. She came to Jesus and said, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. And then the man with the demonized son in Matthew 17, he said, Lord, have mercy on my son. All the way through the Gospels, we see over and over again the incidents of people asking for mercy and receiving healing or deliverance from demons. The important point to embrace is all healing is due to God's mercy. That's the point I'm trying to put together here. You know, I, I can't be healed because of my sin. That's right. But it's God's mercy that they were seeking for their healing. And likewise, we can do the same. No one earns it. No one deserves it. Healing is not a reward for being a good boy or being a good girl. It's not a reward for being holy. It's a, it's a gift of God because of His mercy and His grace. What is required is having faith that this is so, as we do with redemption and salvation. I, 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 Jesus re, is referred to as the merciful and faithful high priest. One of my favorite verses in the Old Testament, probably yours too, is in Exodus 34. When, when Moses had asked God to reveal himself to him. And uh, it, it says, Then Yahweh, in Exodus 34, 6 and 7, Yahweh passed in front of him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, God, compassionate, and that's that word merciful, and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet... He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. He will not by no means, by no means leave the guilty unpunished. But here's the issue. He does forgive iniquity, transgression, and sins because of the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ paid for the sins of humanity. And because of that, we have received forgiveness. The ones that, that are punished are those that didn't receive forgiveness. We receive forgiveness when we accept Jesus as our Lord. And then when we sin and we ask for forgiveness, we receive it today. And then after we take a 10-minute break, we're going to talk about some more doubts. All right.